So now let's look at the Treaty of Versailles. How do you negotiate a peace treaty to end a war that started with no real objectives in mind and then became framed as a war for freedom and self-determination? Very vague, abstract concepts. How do you prevent another war like this from breaking out? And how do you decide who was responsible for World War I? Who started it? What started it? What made it keep going? Who should pay for it? The Treaty of Versailles was supposed to settle these questions and surprise, surprise, it did not fully succeed in doing so. And I'll start by reiterating that just like last time, the best way to keep track of information in this lesson is to separately keep track of each country's perspective leading into the Treaty of Versailles so that you can understand why it included what it included and also why it didn't work and caused problems despite the best of intentions. If you missed yesterday's lesson, um, briefly, one way of doing this, if you think by organizing information into charts, like I do, would be to set up your notes like you see on the screen. Make sure to note somewhere to the winning parties, the allies and the losers, uh, noting that it was France, Britain and the United States negotiating this treaty. Another way of Taking notes on multiple perspectives that's pretty great is to personify them and like use speech bubbles to do a lot of the heavy lifting. So if you missed yesterday's class, you can pause the slide here and kind of get a look at the preview of how each ally approached the war, colored in blue, and how Germany saw things, colored in orange here. Or, you can pause the video here and read over the information you missed. Either way, make sure to get that in your notes before you begin today's lesson. In today's lesson, we're going to look at more detail on what everybody wanted from the Treaty of Versailles and why, and then also what did the treaty actually include in the end. The First World War, as we've seen, had been awful. 10 million people died. The part of France where there had been fighting was completely destroyed. It was called the Western Front. And by November 1918, finally, Germany had signed a ceasefire. The Germans could not fight any longer. After the United States entered the war and gave the Allies that fresh boost in terms of more material, more money, more troops, they surrendered. Or sorry, they didn't surrender. More troops. They asked for an armistice. Importantly, crucially for what happens next, they were not defeated in any big obvious battle. They didn't even think they truly surrendered and the public at home certainly had no idea what was going on. Rather, exhausted from the fighting, they believed that they were putting an end to the war and that a treaty that followed would not be punitive or punishing to them. They were wrong. In January 1919, delegates from 32 countries met at Versailles, a city near Paris, to make treaties to end the war. The meeting was known as the Versailles Conference. There were a number of treaties that came out of it. The one that people focus most on is the Treaty of Versailles. For something to go into the treaty, France, Britain, and the United States had to agree to it each negotiating for what they really wanted and making compromises on points that were less important to them. Germany had no say in the treaty whatsoever. This is also going to be important because it's going to feel to the Germans like it was imposed on them. As we covered briefly already, different experiences in war led to different expectations for the peace treaty from every negotiating party. For example, France experienced most trench warfare on French soil, which meant most of the damage was on French soil. And if you look at the map at the bottom, you'll see a French village circled in pink, and then look up from that and you'll see the trenches basically right there. So it wasn't just like the French countryside, which is beautiful, got damaged. It was towns completely demolished, completely destroyed. Um, some industrial centers too. France had committed millions of troops and billions of dollars towards the war, 
without having started the war or done anything to provoke the war itself. And France shared a border with Germany, which now was really scary. Contrast that with the United States, which was also an ally. The United States didn't join the war until 1917, so three years in. No battles were fought on American soil. The American homeland was completely protected during the war and would be protected from a future European war by the oceans that separate it from Europe. So the United States risked nothing, made some money, and was feeling pretty safe. Germany, on the other hand, had a different war experience still. It had fought a war on two fronts, Eastern and Western, and it had gained the most territory over the course of the war, so Germans would argue that they'd actually been winning. They appealed for peace because the economy was about to collapse. And if you remember, there had been a communist revolution in Russia and communism spreading was kind of scary. And they could argue, and they would argue, that they needed their strength to fight communism to make sure there wasn't a communist takeover at home. Moreover, all of the allies got roped into the war for very different reasons. And so all of them had very different expectations of peace, which were reasonable from their individual perspectives, but combined, it was kind of a mess. Another thing we can look at before we go further is just the amount of death that each of these states had dealt with during the war. If you look at the pie chart in the middle, you can see military deaths um, with each participant, each major participant, as a proportion of the whole. And you'll notice that Germany and Russia had it the worst, that France was up there, and the United States, I mean, relatively, each death, of course, is a tragedy, but relative to the other powers, hadn't really suffered very much at all. Another way of looking at these kinds of figures is to look at casualty numbers and then look at how many casualties there were as a percentage of people mobilized for war. And these numbers are staggering. In Russia, 76.3% of the people who had been mobilized for war became casualties. In France, that number was also 76.3. That means of the French military, 76% of those fighting men had been casualties. That's not only tragic for them, and for France in the moment, it meant that moving forward, France would have a problem filling its ranks of military. The people who were of age to fight were gone. Um, in Britain, that number is still really high. It's not 76%, it's 38 though, or 35.8. Um, you know, huge, huge numbers. The United States, meanwhile, sitting relatively comfortably at 8.2% of casualties as a percentage of men mobilized. Germany also had it pretty bad, 64.9%. So if you'd like to pause the slide here and have a look at those numbers, you can, but then please press play to keep going. If you're in class, you should have a worksheet that looks something like this. And what I'd like you to do is pause the slide and try to figure some of these questions out for yourself. What we're about to do is go through each state's perspective of the war on you know, the most major issues so that you can really understand what goes into making a treaty like this and why nobody was happy with it at the end. And remember, your understanding of this point is going to shape your understanding of the rest of 20th century history. So it's super important. This is kind of a huge turning point moment in history. So um, if you have this worksheet, I'd like you to go state by state until you get to a shaded gray line. And then move on to the next chunk of questions. If you don't, um, you can just listen along as I go through the reasoning and add to your notes. Let's look at who started the war first and who won, like basic questions that you'd think that people could agree with, and mostly in normal wars, they probably would have been able to. From France's perspective, Germany definitely started the war. Germany attacked France 
for basically no reason, according to the French. And the Allies definitely won the war. From the French perspective, French soldiers contributed a lot to that victory in terms of blood. So it was the Allies, but it was, you know, in large part, French soldiers did a lot to help win that war. Furthermore, we need to look at propaganda and democracy. All of the representatives from the allied countries, France, Britain, and the United States, came from democracies, and their leaders were accountable to their voters back home. So they can't make decisions that are too far out of line with public opinion. Given propaganda during the war, given the messages that they were shaping public opinion with during the war, would public opinion be in favor of a harsh peace, in favor of punishing Germany? For France, the answer is yes. Propaganda depicted the Germans as morally questionable people. You can see an example on the bottom left of the slide that depicts a German soldier stabbing a baby that says, for God, um, country, and emperor, as the caption. Um, but also, like a lot of French people themselves would have seen the damage of the war because the Western Front was in France. So given all of that information, the French definitely thought Germany should be blamed for the war. Clearly their fault. Now let's look at the British. The British also believed that Germany started the war because they went through Belgium to attack France. And for the British, the Allies also very clearly won that war. And they would also add that British soldiers, the British Navy, and the British economy contributed a lot to that victory. In terms of propaganda, things get a little interesting already because while public opinion at home would probably favor a harsh peace because propaganda had also depicted the Germans as morally questionable people and British leaders had promised the public revenge, British statesmen privately, like the people who make policy, didn't think that the treaty should actually be too harsh because the British were particularly worried about communism spreading and they wanted Germany to remain strong enough to stop that from happening. If you look at the map, Germany is between Russia, where the communist state the Soviet Union had developed, and France and Britain. So Britain was kind of of two minds, like the public definitely wanted revenge, statesmen also with an eye of public you know, safety decided that they didn't really want the Germans punished too much because Germany needed to be at least strong enough to stop communism. However, all of these things combined to form a British opinion that definitely did also want Germany to be blamed for the war. The United States' experience was very different. For the United States, Germany got the United States involved in the war by sending that telegram to Mexico but imperialism caused the war generally. So the problem for the United States was imperialism, empire, that's the problem. For the United States, the Allies won the war. And while the United States helped more economically than anything, it still behaved as a state that had been crucial in that victory. And to be fair, it had been, it just hadn't fought as hard for it. For propaganda and democracy, the United States was in a tricky position because there were a ton of German immigrants in the United States. And so the US had always been kind of careful about how it talked about Germany and that actually explained its reluctance to join the war to begin with. The United States did not want a harsh peace. Staying neutral was important to the Americans. And because of those German immigrants in the US who were also voters, there was a lot of pressure to keep the peace terms reasonable. And remember, the US thought imperialism was more responsible for the war than Germany. And all of the allies, the other allies were empires. So given all that, the United States did think that Germany should be blamed for the war, but it also thought that Europe's system of empires caused the war and should be dismantled. The other European empires did not like this idea at all. All right, now to the loser. Germany's perspective was very, very different still. Germany completely disagrees that it started the war. From the German perspective, 
Russia started the war because Russia mobilized first. In terms of who won and why, Germany says, we surrendered because our army chiefs said we couldn't win, but we didn't exactly lose the war on the battlefield either. We just recognized that the war couldn't be won. In a way, we did everybody a favor by trying to get everybody to stop. However, we were under the impression when we surrendered, or when we asked for an armistice, that the peace treaty would follow Wilson's, American President Wilson's 14 points, which would allow self-determination and not be super harsh against us. And this was not the case in the end. In terms of propaganda and democracy and the question of a harsh peace, here's how propaganda affected Germany. Because of propaganda, people in Germany believed that they had been winning the war up to the moment it ended. And this is a problem. The feeling among the vast majority was that Germany didn't really lose. And while Germany had been an empire with a king during the war, after the war, it became a democratic republic. And the democratic government was in charge when the treaty was negotiated. So that democratic government would be blamed for the treaty. And that's not going to be good for the future. Anyway, given all of this, Germany does not agree that Germany should be blamed for the war at all. Now let's look at some of the costs of war and the war experience. France spent $26 billion, roughly, on the war. And in terms of economic damage on the home front, on French soil, there was a ton. Towns were destroyed along the front as was a big part of France's industrial zone. And you can really see that in the picture on the bottom left of a village in France before and after the war, completely destroyed. So the overall effect on France's economy was terrible. Economically then, France was looking for reparations for damages in the peace treaty, meaning payment to cover some of this damage. And access to industrial resources in terms of territory to make up for the destruction of French industrial resources like coal mines and stuff, the things that are really critical to powering an economy. Britain had different costs. Um, Britain spent 38 billion on the war, so more money. But in terms of economic damage, on the home front, there wasn't very much. There were some bombers that affected England a tiny bit, so more than the United States, but much less than France. And the overall effect on the British economy of the war was bad, but it wasn't terrible. Economically then, Britain was looking for compensation for the costs of war in a peace treaty. The US, very different story. The U.S. spent $22 billion on the war and suffered no economic damage on the home front as a result of it. And actually, the war's effect on the American economy was great. America made money from the war and ended it with the least debt. Economically, the U.S. had very different aims in the peace treaty then, and mostly it had its eye on trade. The U.S. had done well economically out of the war and saw keeping open trade, free trade, as key. Reparations for Germany, therefore, should be low in order to keep the economy moving and trading possibilities up. Germany spent $39 billion on the war and it had a bit of economic damage on the German front. Most of the fighting took place in France and in Eastern Europe, but some German territory was damaged. However, the German economy was severely affected by a blockade that the Allies put into place to, you know, because it was total war and that helped. So stuff cost a ton more in Germany than it did before the war. And so the economy was already hurting. The war's overall effect on the German economy then was actually pretty bad. Like people were basically about to starve and inflation was going crazy. In a peace treaty then, Germany wanted the treaty to reflect the fact that Germany didn't lose on the battlefield, 
So, like, Germany thinks nobody won the war. And it wants the Allies to let the German economy recover. Like, how are we supposed to pay you when our money is becoming worthless? Next up, looking at geography. How much would each country be worried about the danger of being attacked by Germany if Germany could keep its armed strength in the future? Um, France is right next to Germany, so it would be very, very worried about the potential for another German attack. Part of this worry came from just the staggering number of casualties and deaths each country suffered. Casualties includes wounded, military deaths is just the dead, but still. In terms of casualties, there are 500,000 civilian casualties. It's people who were not in the army. There were over 6 million military casualties. And as said before, as a percentage of people mobilized, that was 76% of men mobilized that became casualties. So that's dead and wounded. Britain, different story. Britain is an island a little bit farther away from Germany. So it was somewhat worried about the potential of a future war, but being an island, it had some security and it wasn't nearly as worried as France. Britain also suffered some pretty big casualty numbers though too. In terms of civilians, almost 300,000 civilians and over 3 million military men were casualties. And as a percentage of people mobilized, that was about 35%, so it's still pretty high. The US, meanwhile, was sitting pretty comfortably protected by an ocean, so it was not at all worried about, you know, a future German attack, like it hadn't been attacked to begin with. The US suffered 750 civilian casualties, so, you know, more than anyone would ever want, but much, much less than the other allies and about 300,000, almost 400,000 military casualties. As a percentage of men mobilized, that would have been 8%. Germany, meanwhile, was worried about keeping order in its country since the economy tanked and the king and empire were replaced with a weak Republican government that didn't have much authority or legitimacy in the eyes of its people. There had already been communist uprisings, so Germany's main concern was actually internal for the moment. The economy was awful, communism inside Germany was scary, and the government, like nobody really believed that it had what it took to keep things in order. And Germany had suffered some pretty high casualty um, figures as well. Almost 700,000 civilians died. Again, those are people who don't sign up to be in the military. That's just regular folks living their lives. Um, over 7 million military casualties. And that made up about 65% of people mobilized ended up as casualties. So dead and wounded. It's crazy. Um, in terms of inflation, too, I added a little tiny graph at the bottom right of this chart so you can see what was going on with the German economy. Um, and one way of like measuring how the economy is affected is by the price of a common item. So one egg in a market would have cost one, or sorry, 0 0.9 marks before the war. Um, by 1921, it would have been 1.6 marks. By July, it would have been seven um, of 1922, seven marks. And then by 1923, it starts to go crazy. And my eyesight is no longer good enough to read the chart that I put on my own slide, but I think it's 5,000 marks. Um, so that's some pretty crazy inflation. Continuing on with this question of geography and security. And again, if it helps to look at a map here, please do. Given all of those figures about the economy and about casualties and about the propaganda, how did the war affect the country's capacity to defend itself and wage war in the future if necessary. Well, France was significantly weakened. 70%, over 70% of its military had become casualties. So its military base had shrunk. Its economy was severely damaged by the war. And the industry necessary to make war materials was destroyed because that was in the industrial zone. So 
France was negotiating from a position not of military strength, but of fear. It couldn't defend itself because its ability to do so had been destroyed by this war that, by the way, it says Germany started. And for France, it did, because France really didn't do anything to provoke that war. Given all of this information, it's going to be super duper important to France that, to reduce Germany's strength and capacity to wage war. For Britain, the British public is going to be less willing to go to war after World War I by a lot. War was traumatic and they had, as we've seen in the last lesson, some pretty impactful war poetry to bring that message home. Um, having seen the trenches, nobody wanted to relive that. So while Britain was more able technically to use some military strength to defend itself if it had to, the public had no appetite for war. Its navy, however, remained supreme in the seas. So Britain was negotiating somewhere in the middle between strength and fear. Given all of this information, it was still pretty important to Britain to reduce Germany's strength and capacity to wage war. The key to British power was to eliminate competition and Germany before the war had been its competition um, for building up a navy. But Britain was still very worried about communism and he wanted Germany strong enough to stop it. So France wanted Germany very, very weak. Britain wanted it somewhere in the middle. For the United States, um, the United States was not at all really affected in terms of its ability to wage war in the future. Its economy was doing great. Its army was basically as strong as it had been before the war. The only thing was that the voting public was not likely to support getting involved in another war far away. The United States, though, was then the only state negotiating from a position of military strength. That's going to become important later on. Given this, it would have kind of been important to the US to reduce Germany's ability to wage war because like the America thought that their vision for peace would prevent future war. Like free trade, America thought, was the thing that would prevent conflict between countries. But it was also really important to the US to preserve Germany's ability to counter communism because guess who's not into free trade on capitalist terms? It's communism. Germany, um, in terms of worrying about how to defend itself, was kind of worried about it. Their army and their economy took a hit, but Germany still had all of its industrial capacity to rebuild the military force if necessary, and that's going to become important later on too. Um, however, Germany didn't get to negotiate at all. Next, let's look at this question of territory, self-determination, and empire. Remember, self-determination means the right of a people to choose their own government. And normally, people living in an empire do not get this right extended to them. So President Wilson of America loved this idea. He loved the idea of creating new states based on democracy because democracies are great trading partners. Um, people in France and Britain, for example, were not thrilled with this idea because part of the point of going to war to begin with was to gain parts of other places' empire. Um, and you can't really do that if you then give them a choice of whether or not to belong to you or not. The question of self-determinant empire then was kind of decided on two different levels. The first was within Europe itself. If you look at the map on the bottom right, you'll see Germany and Austria-Hungary taking a huge amount of real estate in Eastern Europe. And you see Russia, um, when Russia became the Soviet Union, it lost some territory to Germany. So there's like land here that needs to be decided. Separately, there's the question of overseas empires. Um, the Ottoman Empire over here had been allied with Germany and it was breaking up. So who's going to get all of that land? Who's going to get German colonies like here in East Africa and here in West Africa, for example? Typically, um, the question of self-determination then ended up being decided 
on two different sort of standards. One standard for Europe in the east over here um, that allowed new states to be created based on this idea that they can choose their own government. Not for Germany though, Germans didn't get to choose whether or not to be part of Germany or a new state, so there's that. And not for the empire either, the people living in this part of the world certainly didn't get to choose to be protectorates of the allies. We're gonna get there. Let's look at how this thinking was shaped to begin with. In deciding the question of self-determination in empire, first, it's important to know which countries had an empire that they wanted to keep or expand. So let's look at France's perspective first. France did have an empire, and actually empire was the only thing that could potentially be won in this stupid war. So getting a bigger empire would have been nice, given all the sacrifice. How likely would it be that France would be for a peace settlement based on this idea of self-determination for people in the empire then? Um, France would not at all have supported this idea. Having an empire depends on not letting the people in the empire vote to determine who governs them. So France was against this, what they saw as a very typically American idea. Given these responses, what position would France have taken on applying the, self, the principle of self-determination to Germany as well, which would make Germany bigger, uniting it with Austria and some lands to the east? So remember, self-determination for Germany meant grouping all German-speaking peoples in one big, big state. Would France have supported this? Absolutely not, because that would make Germany the strongest industrial nation in Europe, and that's kind of the opposite of the goal for France, because France had just been attacked out of nowhere, and it wants Germany to not be strong so it doesn't do it again. Britain had a somewhat similar perspective. Britain also had an empire that it wanted to keep and expand. And again, winning parts of other losers overseas empires was one of the only potential things to be gotten out of this war. Britain then would not at all have been for a peace settlement based on the idea of self-determination for people in the empire, because having an empire depends on not letting the people in the empire vote to determine who governs them. However, Britain's perspective on self-determination for Germany and the German people in Europe was slightly different. Germ uh, Britain thought that it was reasonable to apply the idea of self-determination to Germany, which would make it bigger, uniting it with Austria and some lands to the east. And remember that phrase, making Germany bigger, uniting it with Austria and some lands to the east, because they're going to become the Nazi Party war aims running up to World War II. Anyway, back to this. Britain thinks this is reasonable, but because of all the propaganda, because of the, the anger that participating in a war um, conjures up with the public, the public at home definitely wanted a no on this. So here again, you see the British statesmen, the people making the peace treaty, in some ways at odds with public sentiment of the British people. America, very different perspective. Technically, America didn't have an empire that it wanted to keep or expand. If you look closer, it definitely had an informal empire, but no official owned territories on the scale of anything like what the European powers had. The US therefore had no real big national interest in colonies, and it wanted colonies of other European states to be democratic and self-governed so that they become more likely to be good trading partners because empires tend to restrict trade to their colonies. But if all of those colonies are free and independent, then you can trade with them freely. Given this, the United States was likely in favor of a peace settlement based on this idea that people in empire should choose their own government. They saw European empire as a threat to free trade and actually think that the spread of democracy and self-determination could only help matters. Applying this to Germany, the United States thought that self-determination should determine state lines everywhere, not just outside of Europe, but in the, inside Europe too. 
Um, the United States, in the sense, was a bit idealistic, and it didn't really know very much of anything about the places specifically in Europe that would be determining their own government. Um, but it thought that applying this principle just in general without really knowing much about the details in typically American fashion um, was the way to go. Germany also had an empire, an overseas empire before the war, a little one, and wanted to keep it. However, Germany was in favor of itself being grouped with other German speaking people. So Germany wanted to keep its possessions, but inside Europe, Germany thought that it should remain united in one state. And since Austria wants to unite with Germany under the principle of self-determination, it should be allowed to do so. Otherwise, the Germans thought the allies were all hypocrites. Let's look again where each country is on the map to look at questions of defense. We have France right next to Germany. We have Britain protected in a small sense because it's an island, so it's close, but not like touching. And then the United States isn't even on the map. It's all the way over here, protected by an ocean. For France, France is likely to need international help to defend itself. Its military population, remember, suffered over 70% casualties and it's on the border. So should anything happen with Germany again, France would probably need a series of alliances to guarantee its safety. Looking at Russia on the map, here's the second question of safety that was increasingly being posed. Remember, the fear of communism spreading was real for all these countries. And communism was now based in the Soviet Union, which is over here. If they formed new states between Germany and the Soviet Union in this little zone, from territory taken away from Germany and the now collapsed Austria-Hungary empire, based on the idea of self-determination, it's possible that the new states they formed here could add as kind of a buffer to keep communism from spreading, literally placing themselves between the Soviet Union over here and the allies over here. France, in terms of applying self-determination to Eastern Europe because of this question of communism, absolutely supported this idea. France wanted to take land away from Germany just in general, so that Germany wasn't the biggest, strongest state in Europe anymore. And applying self-determination to the land here, letting independent states form and choose their own governments here, would also take land away from the Soviet Union, which they thought was good because communism. France by itself couldn't guarantee the protection of any new states that were formed here though. So that was a you know lingering question. For Britain, on a map, Britain might be in need of help defending itself should war break out again, because it's an island and it had a big navy, but it is very close to the European continent. The empire, though, afforded Britain some security. However, um, Britain was nonetheless completely for forming new states here in Eastern Europe to act as a buffer between Western Europe over here and the spread of communism from the now very threatening Soviet Union over here. The United States, looking at the bigger map, so Europe's here and the United States is all the way over here. Um, the United States was not likely to need help defending itself. The oceans did that for them. However, um, the United States took an active interest in keeping communism from spreading. This is an old story. And if self-determination were applied to states in this zone over here, then that would create new independent trading partners for the United States, which is what the United States loves. Plus, creating new states over here was kind of America's idea. So Americans are for this. Germany, clearly, as the loser, um, has a different perspective. 
In terms of security, Germany is here wedged between Western Europe, who they just lost a war to, and the now menacing Soviet Union. And remember, leading up to the peace conference, there have been a few communist and nationalist uprisings in Germany itself. So Germany actually does think it might need help protecting itself um, if conflict were to break out. It's next door to France, and France hates Germany now. And communist Russia is kind of scary. However, Germany absolutely does not agree that the solution is to create independent states between itself and the former borders of Russia. Um, this territory over here in Eastern Europe contains large numbers of Germans, and you think it's wrong, they think it's wrong to separate them from the fatherland, to like divide them up into different states against their will. So looking specifically, because that's a little complicated, specifically at the territory that Russia lost to Germany, it would have been like here-ish between Russia and Germany. And that's where um, the buffer zone to kind of prevent communism from spreading by creating new democratic states was proposed. If you look at the ethnic map of Europe, though over here, you can see that there are ethnically Germans kind of stretched around multiple states that are about to be created <laughs> in this treaty. So that's what they mean by self-determination being applied to Germany. If Germans were allowed to choose their own government, this whole blue territory would be German. Um, and instead here you can see a preview of what ends up happening. Final set of considerations. Should they form a League of Nations to protect themselves? The only way to make sure that any new states formed in Eastern Europe are safe from a potential takeover from the Soviet Union was to guarantee their safety by forming a League of Nations, a formal alliance. France supported forming a League of Nations to keep the peace and to enforce the terms of whatever treaty they came up with because France couldn't do it by itself. It needed help and France was right next door to Germany. Given everything that we've covered, the voting public at home for France was also likely to support a League of Nations to keep the peace. Very likely. They loved this idea. And given everything that we've covered in terms of the economy and also military strength, France was not able to enforce any terms of this treaty or League of Nations decisions after this war experience all by itself. France's military strength had been depleted by the war, and it would take decades to build it back up again. Britain also supported forming a League of Nations to enforce the treaty that came out of this conference and to guarantee the safety of states in Eastern Europe, but it depended a whole lot less on that League of Nations than France did. So it was, you know, supported it, but less so. People at home in Britain also generally vaguely supported a League of Nations, but much less so than France. And in terms of military strength, though Britain ended the war in better shape than France did, all by itself, it would not be able to enforce any terms of the Treaty of Versailles or by itself guarantee the, the safety of any nations formed in Eastern Europe. This is gonna come back again in a couple of years. The United States, again, left the war in a very, very different position. It made money, very few people died. Um, the United States statesman Woodrow Wilson himself proposed the League of Nations, so he supported it. But the voting public at home did not. They did not want to get roped into another European war um, if they could at all avoid it. And as a democracy, that makes a big difference. So the person whose idea it was was like, yeah, this is an awesome idea. but he didn't do the political work of gathering support at home. The voting public, like I said, not at all supportive of a League of Nations. And yet, the United States all by itself, given the strength of its military and economy, were stronger than they were before the World War started. So the US was in a position to enforce the Treaty of Versailles and League of Nations decisions 
and help guarantee the safety of those states in Eastern Europe that the United States proposed creating itself. But the United States did not want to join the organization whose job it was to do these things. Germany was actually pretty sure that a strong Germany was Europe's best hope to keep the continent safe from communism. Like you don't need the League of Nations, just leave Germany strong and Germany can do it by itself. Germany was also annoyed that there were large German populations in the areas of Eastern Europe and the Allies don't seem to want to let them unite as one German state. It seemed very hypocritical from Germany's point of view. Um, in terms of joining the League of Nations, the question was moot. They don't get to join the League of Nations. And so like, it didn't matter what the voting public thought because they weren't even invited to the club. So given all of this, here's what each state wanted out of the treaty, given its experience and its situation out of the war. France wanted protection and compensation for all of the war damages, including access to resources to rebuild the industrial capacity it had lost in a war that it did not start itself. Britain wanted compensation for the costs of war and limits on the German army so the British could have the biggest navy still. And Britain wanted a bigger empire. The United States wanted very different things. Um, President Woodrow Wilson believed he had the answer, a peace proposal he called the 14 points. And he was sure that this proposal would make, quote, the world safe for democracy and avoid any future conflict. However, several other world leaders, as well as some of Wilson's fellow citizens, didn't agree. Wilson, as the representative of America in this peace conference, wanted the peace treaty to address the future, to keep the peace in the future, following his brilliant, or so he thought, plan. Um, so he wanted like idealistic goals, trading partners, that sort of thing. Um, very little about like, protecting other European states and compensating them for war damages. In terms of the treaty, our loser, Germany, wanted fairness. And for Germans, that meant applying the same standards to Germany as they applied everywhere else. Germany especially felt very strongly that the German people should be united in one state and that the reparations, that any money that Germany has to pay out in compensation for the war costs and damage should be small enough to still allow the German economy to grow and any sort of military restrictions should be small enough to still give Germany a big military edge so that it could protect everybody else from communism. That was the line. So given all of these multiple perspectives, pause here and note for each country from that country's perspective, were their demands of the peace treaty reasonable and were they fair? And then press play again. Now that we've gone through all that mess, let's look at the actual treaty that came out of it, the Treaty of Versailles, the treaty that was supposed to end war in general, in addition to making right the wrongs, all of them for everyone, of that caused the war to begin with. First, there was the question of war guilt. Who should be blamed for war? Well, the Allies, Britain, the United States, and France decided, obviously, Germany. Germany was forced to accept the full responsibility for the war, admitting the war was completely their fault. And this in particular was something that Germans at home felt very bitter about, and it's going to come back to kind of haunt Europe down the line. Um, Article 231 specifically said the Allied and Associate Governments affirm and Germany accepts the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage to which the Allied and Associate Governments and their nationals have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. This clause was supposed to solve the following problems. It was supposed to establish the basis for every other part of the treaty, including reparations, army reductions, territory losses, all of those things only make sense if the war was Germany's fault. 
It was also supposed to discourage future wars of aggression by holding Germany responsible for its aggressive war. However, in the future, this is going to cause some problems. Germany won't think that this treaty is legitimate because of this clause. And as a result, it's gonna feel pretty okay with breaking its terms, specifically after 1933. Sympathetic allies also might not think that this was super fair and might not enforce the terms of the treaty when it really, really counts. Again, sometime between 1933 and 1939 when it really, really counted. Next up, reparations or payment. Germany had to pay back the full cost of the war. This included the cost of every bullet that was fired as well as any damages done to other countries. As you can imagine, this is a lot of money. Um, eventually, it was set to 132 billion gold marks. Again, this was supposed to discourage future aggression, and it wasn't unheard of to have the loser of a war pay the costs of the war. Um, it was also supposed to help the Allies' economies revive. However, this causes some pretty big problems. It contributes to tanking Germany economy and as we will see moving forward when the economy tanks and you have a nation full of people who are kind of bitter about it politically extreme ideologies and leaders can kind of take root it causes a lot of resentment in germany and it leads to the impression among some germans that germany needs to expand and gain territory itself to be self-sufficient to be strong enough um, to not be treated this way in the future. Next, we'll look at military reductions. Germany could no longer maintain a large military. Its armed forces were limited to a size that was too small to effectively defend the country. Its navy was limited to only defensive capabilities, and it was forbidden to possess an air force of any kind because airplanes can drop bombs. Specifically, the army was limited to 100,000 men. The German Navy could only have six battleships and no submarines, and they were absolutely not allowed to have an air force. Remember that later when we talk about Germans rebuilding an air force in secret, sometime after 1933. In theory, this was supposed to keep Germany from being able to launch another aggressive war, but in practice, it caused some problems. Germans felt powerless and therefore grew more likely to elect a strong leader that promised to restore the country to greatness. They felt like this kind of handicapped them and it was humiliating. And so when a politician comes around talking about this humiliation and promising to restore strength, that appeals to a lot of people in a way that it might not have without this kind of clause in the treaty. Similarly, and just as importantly down the line, Limitations on the military meant that lots and lots and lots of people who had been in the military were fired at a time when the German economy was terrible. So you end up with lots of unemployed, angry, weapons trained men who are used to violence kind of kicking around. And um, that is going to feed into the armed shock forces of Nazi Germany a couple of years down the line, 10, 20 years down the line. Next was the question of territories. Germany was forced to give up all of its foreign colonies, mostly to England. In addition, its domestic territory, land in Europe, was reduced to keep it from going to be the most powerful country in Europe and some of its most productive land was given to France as compensation for war damages to France's industrial zones. And on the east to Poland, also land was given there to give the new state a chance at economic self-sufficiency. So here on the slide, you'll see all of this was Germany before and only the dark blue bits remained. Specifically, the Saar, 
um, in Western Germany was given to France for 15 years because it was rich in cold fields and that's really important for industrialization. The Rhineland also on this side of Germany, sorry, look at this map over here, Western Germany over here, um, was demilitarized. So the army was not allowed to go there, which gave France kind of a buffer zone on its border. A territory called Alsace-Lorraine that had been taken from France in a war in 1870 was given back to France. Germany and Austria, which is over here, were not allowed to unite into one state. Land in East Germany, um, rich farmland, was given to Poland, a new state over here, as was this corridor between Germany and Poland to give Poland some access to the sea, which kind of split Germany off into two little blobs. All of Germany's colonies were taken and given to France and Britain as mandates, which is another nicer way of saying colonies. In theory, this provided some economic compensation for the war to the Allies and would limit the size and strength of Germany to prevent it from launching another war. In practice, this also caused great resentment in Germany and strengthened the idea that the Allies were making Germany weak and humiliated on purpose. It also completely weakened the moral argument that the treaty was based on this idea of self-determination as a right, the right of a people to choose their own country, because that right was not extended to the German people, nor was it extended to the people in the overseas colonies. It also gave Germany the language that it would need to argue for taking territory that contains a majority German population. Land over here that was given to Poland, this bit of Czechoslovakia, and the desire to unite with Austria would become um, parts of the goals of the Nazi party that would come to power around 1933 in Germany. And they were able to make an argument using the Allies' own moral language of self-determination. We should have the right to unite German-speaking people in one state. After all, that's what they want. It also gave Germany the ability to characterize the Allies as a bunch of power-hungry, empire-building hypocrites, which is going to feed into propaganda down the line. So wrapping up, here is the state of the European map after the war. Before the war, it looked like this. After the war, there are a bunch of new states in this part of the world. Um, they're new, they're not experienced with democracy, and they're pretty vulnerable, squished as they are between Germany over here and the world's first communist state, the Soviet Union, formerly known as Russia over here. Finally, the League of Nations. A League of Nations was created to establish and keep the peace. And this was a hugely important landmark in the history of international diplomacy, as it was a first step forwards in terms of the kinds of cooperation that we now see functional in the United Nations. However, the United States, which proposed it to begin with, did not join the League of Nations. So the only state that could have enforced any of its decisions did not join. And Germany wasn't allowed to join. So if Germany had grievances, it wasn't allowed to bring them to the League as a member. Articles 1 through 26 of the treaty describe the covenant of the League of Nations and Germany not being allowed to join. Um, the reason America didn't join was because President Wilson couldn't get Congress to ratify it. The U.S. didn't want to be pulled into another state's war, so the U.S. stayed out of it. Meanwhile, the other great powers, so-called, were significantly weakened by the First World War. So again, the only country that had anything close to the strength that you would need to enforce the Treaty of Versailles, the United States, didn't join the League of Nations and didn't necessarily agree with a lot of the provisions of the treaty either. In theory, forming the League of Nations was a, a way to have different states resolve conflicts peacefully together instead of going to war. In practice, without the ability to enforce any League decisions since the U.S. didn't join, its ability to resolve conflicts peacefully was significantly limited 
and its ability to intervene to stop a conflict was basically non-existent. Also, Germany felt like it had no way to resolve conflicts diplomatically since it wasn't in the League of Nations. So to summarize the Treaty of Versailles in a number of ways, it included terms that in retrospect seem harsh, but individually given every state's perspective were reasonable at the time, I guess. Um, it was supposed to make Germany powerless to start another war, but actually it had the opposite effect, giving Germany every reason to want to, or to feel like they had to, or so would say the Nazi party. Provisions can be summarized in terms of the League of Nations, territorial losses, military restrictions, um, reparations, and war guilt. And where we're going with this is nowhere nice. One of the things that happened after the war was that the economy tanked in a lot of places in Europe, and then 10 years later in the United States, tanking it worldwide even further. And as the economy tanked, extremist politics gained power. Germany was left with a harsh peace. And that's especially tricky because information that had been flowing into Germany from the war consisted mostly of we're winning and then all of a sudden Germany lost, which opened the door for a lot of conspiracy theories, like this completely baseless idea that Germany had been betrayed by people, elements within the ranks, communists and Jews especially. Not true, but that became a popularly held notion. Attempts to address this problem by establishing Western values like self-determination sloppily in regions with differing opinions on how national boundaries should be drawn further weaken the Allied powers. And this is going to fuel the extremist politics of the interwar years, the time between World War I and World War II. We've already seen Soviet communism take root during the war in Russia, which became the Soviet Union. But then in Germany, Italy first, we'll get to that story shortly, in Germany, we'll see right-wing extremism in the form of fascism and Nazism that promote a strong, pure, aggressive, violent state take root. Each of these extremes takes the form of totalitarian government during those years. And each of these extremes hate each other, and in hating each other, they kind of make themselves even more extreme. So one of the big fascist and Nazi lines was, you know, communists are bad, they make us weak. We need to stamp them out. And they gain support by people who are afraid of communism. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was very anti-fascist. So we'll get to that story shortly, but that's where we're going. <clears throat> in terms of notes for the day, two options. One, if you are getting success juggling multiple points of view with thought bubbles and like personifying each of these states, pause the slide here and take notes. Um, this is a great summary of how varying perspectives established the treaty, which I summarized in the green blob, and how individually they kind of reacted to it. But then press play again so you can read over the key points and make sure that you have any detail that you need, including the problems it's going to cause in your notes. So pause the slide here and make sure that you have these details summarized in your notes. <clears throat> 